there it is, the sermon. <laughs> <laughs> Carlos does this regularly. <laughs> Those of us of a certain age, at least, should have thought about Bobby McFerrin. It is with regret that Bobby McFerrin will not be with us this morning to say <laughs> Our New Testament lesson this morning is from the book of Luke, chapter 12, verses 22 to 40. It can be found in the vision of the size of the crowd that beat up at this point. And he's just responded to a voice from the crowd by telling the parable of the rich fool who stored up crops. We remember, all remember that story, of course. For the future, but ignore the present. Page 1616, verse 22. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat, or you about your body, you will wear. Life is more than food and the body, more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no store in your barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds, who for you by worrying can add a single hour to his life. Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you? <clears throat> o you of little faith, and do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world run, runs about all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, let us let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Why do we worry? Seriously. Why would we possibly worry about anything? I find it interesting that Matthew, in chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, tells us the very same story about Jesus telling us not to worry. This is often you find the same story almost word for word in more than one gospel. Now Luke wrote his gospel from the years 59 to 63, <coughs> and Matthew is credited for writing his gospel from 60 to 70. I think it's possible that they colluded in writing this about this particular quote, or they both were really taken, seriously taken by that particular tale that Jesus told, that, that admonishment not to worry. And what is important is that Jesus tells us not to worry. What was the question I asked? Why do we worry? Worry is the motion defined as being anxious over actual or potential difficulties. Worry affects everyone. In today's turbulent culture, or lack thereof, people worry about their health, their wealth, their jobs, careers, families, futures. And Jesus understood this tendency of us mortals. We are human to worry. That is precisely why he addressed this issue and not the least bit subtly. Jesus commanded us not to worry. And he told us exactly why we shouldn't. He gave us four points to consider about worry. Worry ignores God's faithfulness. Worry ignores God's faithfulness. If he can feed the birds and clothe the flowers, doesn't it make sense that he'll provide for us? Number two, worry ignores its own limitations. <coughs> Has anything ever, ever changed for the better because we worried about it? 
Yet we keep on doing it. Number three, God, worry ignores God's love. He said in there that unbelievers like fatherless orphans worry about the future. So we're believers. We should not. And fourth, worry ignores the present. You know, if you worry about Monday, you're going to miss out on an awful lot of great stuff that happens on Sunday. If you do find yourself worrying, ask yourself, which of these four things am I ignoring? Reflect a minute for that last little bit. Do you think that God intends that we just sit back and let him provide? I don't think so. He will provide. But we need to perform a task or tasks in order to help him along. Food is abundant. We know that. There's food thrown away in this country just all over the place. Food is abundant, but you have to buy it or trade for it, which means that you have to create some wealth in order to be able to buy or trade it. Of course, the same is true of all of our needs, wants, and wishes. Probably one of the most frequently quoted Bible verses, which is not in the Bible, is that God helps those who help themselves. It's not in there. But just because it isn't, isn't in the Bible, there's no reason that it's not a, good, it's not a good point. God will provide. If you sit and worry about the situation, nothing's getting done. If you jump up on your own hind legs and start making things happen, it will happen. And suddenly, voila. Wow, your needs and wants and wishes are fulfilled as much as God thinks you need them. And the wishes and wants comes into question, doesn't it? Our needs are fulfilled by God. Wishes and wants. You got to do a little more work for that part. You know, worry can and does paralyze you if you succumb to its violence. I think to think that worry and fear kind of walk hand in hand. You worry about something, you're definitely afraid of what might happen. I guess it's possible to go through life worrying about something all the time. Is that guy going to pull out in front of me? What if the boss doesn't like what I just did? What if a family member gets sick? What if we get hit by a hurricane? What if, what if, what if? Worry is the last <clears throat> on an alphabetical list of recognized emotions. There are 61 emotions altogether. Take heart, I'm not going to read them to you. <laughs> <laughs> we have communion yet today, don't we? Feel free to look it up on the internet. I did, and down the path I went and forgot all about where I was supposed to be. The internet's devious that way. But I found all 61 emotions. God gave us our emotions when he created us. All 61 of them. And they all have a purpose in place. You can question worry. It's being able to control them that makes a difference. Now traditionally, we Presbyterians have not been very emotional. In more recent years, that's not quite held true as much as it did 100 or so years ago. We were thought of as staid and quiet people. You will seldom to never hear someone speak up during a sermon in one of our services in any Presbyterian church that I know of. Yet if we go over here to Heaven and Grace to St. James AME, by now I'd have had 25 odd men and somebody hollers, Preach it, preach it! We don't do that. We're quiet and stay people. It's not wrong, it just is. As I look and think about Presbyterians of old, I think of, a, of the gentlemen sitting in their pews with their very dark suits and their very stiff white collars, staring down into their laps in a prayerful attitude throughout the service. And that's how Presbyterians years ago, according to Dr. Fool, became known as hat sniffers. It was a way to do things. No 
no emotions. The emotions we see in the Bible are fear, worry, love, hate, compassion, envy, pride, and so on and so on. I told you when you read the whole list. And of course the love is the command that Jesus says above all others. Over the past several months, I have observed and experienced emotions of happiness, sadness, joy, etc. A month ago, I was in this pulpit, and many of you may have noticed it, I choked up during my sermon. And I don't remember the exact circumstance, but suddenly, my throat closed, my eyes watered. I was moved by something outside of me that said, preach it, preacher. A week later, my amigo Cliff was relating something which was very personal and very moving. And so it was obvious that he was caught up in that emotion. He had the same sensation of almost crying. Two weeks ago, Dr. Toole was delivering a very powerful first-person sermon, and it was obvious the subject was near and dear to his heart, as he also became emotional. Last Sunday, Carol was talking with the children, talking about feelings. And suddenly there was a momentary pause. It was not for effect. He'd gotten caught up in the message and had to regroup and get his voice back. I've had the same thing happen when reading a powerful piece of literature or a poem. They were having you. I believe that's a nudge from God. Just to remind me of my humanness. You're tracking along thinking you got everything under control. All of a sudden, there it is. Another emotion that God delivered us, to us is the emotion of unbridled joy. Now we talk about joy during Advent because it's a joy Sunday. But joy is with us all the time. Be a moment when a particular piece of music is being played or sung, and my breath catches, and I involuntarily grunt a moan. And at the same time, I get goosebumps. A very good friend of mine who's a Pentecostal preacher called those Holy Ghost clubs. That another, that's a, just another moment when I feel God's breath on my In a couple minutes, we'll be sharing the bread and cup of communion. Every month, we, when we are in that moment when soft music is being played, and I have the occasion to bow my head and thank, thank God for that gift of the sacrament of communion, my entire body will tingle. And I break out Holy Ghost bumps. That is a moment when I'm really into that worshipful attitude that Carol told us about last week. And I really feel the presence of God. <clears throat> I think it's wonderful that we can express our emotions. I would hate to have to go through life bottling up my joy, my love, my excitement, and oh yes, my sadness and confusion. How would it be to suppress the feeling of guilt when we know we've done something that we really truly should not have. Golly, you know, we do we have a confession every Sunday morning. When we talk with God about our wrongs, it's not just word sins, wrongs, things we've done wrong. Well, I know every Sunday that I need to have a talk with God because there's something that's gone a little wrong. I'm not going to bottle up that guilt. Which brings us back to the emotion of worry. When we become anxious over actual or potential difficulties, Jesus clearly instructs, nay, commands us not to worry. Remember I told you a bit ago that worry ignores God's faithfulness? 
Worry ignores its own limitations. Worry ignores God's love. And worry ignores the presence. What is there to worry about? Back to my question from the beginning. Why do we worry? This past couple of weeks, I got what could be considered troubling news from my doctor. Turned out nothing wrong. Here I was in the process of developing a sermon to instruct you not to worry. So what did I do? Prove my humanness one more time. Start fret. Start thinking about all the things that could happen. Fortunately, I went into my office and Luke 12 was open on my desk. And I realized there is absolutely nothing over which I am in charge. I let go and let God have that way. I felt better. The next time you or a friend or family member start to worry, turn your instruction manual and let's get back on the right track. Amen. Our right, next hymn is number 349. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah. 